that you would give us the strength and the peace to be able to surrender and submit to your will and your will alone. We thank you and we love you. In Jesus' name, amen. At this time, we're going to go ahead and dismiss our children for Children's Church. If you can just make your way out towards Andre, towards my left, to these double doors. Well, good morning. <laughs> it should bring a smile to your faces to see those children go out those doors. I know it always warms my heart to see the children running, running towards the doors. This morning, I'm going to end my series in the book of Jonah. We're going to be in the book of Jonah, chapter 4. Over the course of the last several weeks, we started in chapter 1, where we saw Jonah refuse to obey the calling that God had put on his heart, which was to go to Nineveh and to go preach to the Assyrians the message of God's forthcoming judgment. But the offer of forgiveness was still there. Jonah decided to run, and as a result, God captured Jonah. He was put into the belly of a fish for three days. And in that three days, there was a time of confession for Jonah. There was a time of getting right with God. There was a time of forgiveness. And as the belly, as, as Jonah came out of the belly of that fish, Little did Jonah know that he was going to be right there along the coast of Nineveh to do what God had originally called him to do. And as we saw last week in, the, in chapter 3, we saw where Jonah went out and he preached God's message of impending judgment. But in his message, he proclaimed that offer a forgiveness was still there if they chose to repent. If they chose to genuinely repent, God's message was forgiveness. So there was a revival that broke out amongst the Assyrians. People asking for God's forgiveness. People repenting. People getting right with God. And this morning, our focus is going to be on how do we respond to God's movement. How did the Assyrians respond we talked about last week? But this week, we're going to talk about how Jonah responded. As we go into chapter 4 here in just a moment, I'm just going to ask you a few questions as we get started this morning. If we saw God move today in a mighty way throughout the land, throughout, when I say the land, throughout the entire world, if we truly allowed God to move, and God desires to move, God does not desire to stand still. God desires for all of us to move forward. Can you imagine today today 
what a revival we would see within the church, what a revival we would see amongst Christians, what a revival we would see as a nation, what a revival we would see as a world if we simply focused on God and His plan and we threw our plan out the door. So the questions that I'm going to ask you this morning is if God moved here today in a mighty way, and He will if we simply allow Him to do so, but if God chose to move today, what would be the church's response? Number one, would we complain about the types of people coming into the church? In a lot of churches throughout this land, and a lot of churches throughout the world this morning, people were refused to come into the doors of the church because they were sinners. Because they were addicts. Because they were struggling in their marriages. Because they didn't have a certain type of clothing on. Because they were sinners. How would our church respond this morning? Number two, would there be concerns in regards to how God's movement affected your comfortability? Many weeks ago, I stood up here and said, it was God's will for us to be uncomfortable. It is God's will for us to be uncomfortable. Because when we become comfortable, when we become comfortable, we become stagnant in our relationship. And you know why that is? It's because when things are going what seem to be and what appear to be our way, we think we don't need God. But we need God just as much in the good times as we need Him in the bad times. So, if God wants to move in your life this morning, it's time you move yourself out of the way. And it's time you get out of your comfort zone. And it's time you get into God's zone. Number three, would we question the authenticity of God's movement if he moved in here this morning? Would you question him as to what he's doing? Last week, we saw things in the story of Jonah where things happened that were beyond God's, it were beyond human understanding. Why did the Assyrians choose to seek God's forgiveness? These people were absolutely evil. Yet God knew, God knew when he called Jonah to go to the land of Nineveh, he knew what the Assyrians were going to do. This morning, as he's working on your heart, he knows what you are going to do. So you need to stop questioning the authenticity of God's movement in your life this morning. Number four, would there be divisions between old and new members this morning if we allowed God to move? Well, it's a shame if we do allow a division or a separation between old and new members because every person in the midst of this church this morning, every person sitting in a pew should be focused on what God desires to do in their own life and not what God desires to do in someone else's life. So as we go through the chapter 4 of the book of Jonah, I want you to focus on those things of how we would react if we allowed God to move. If there was a movement in here this morning, and there's already been a movement, how are you going to respond to it? So with that being said, if you could open your Bibles to Jonah chapter 4, I'm going to begin reading in verse 1. For those of you that can stand, I'm going to ask that you please stand in honor of God's word. This change of plans greatly upset Jonah, and he became very angry. So he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. I knew that you are a merciful and compassionate God, slow to get angry and filled with unfailing love. You are eager to turn back from destroying people. 
Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive if what I predicted will not happen. The Lord replied, is it right for you to be angry about this? Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sit under as he waited to see what would happen to the city. And the Lord God arranged for a leafy plant to grow there, and soon it spread its broad leaves over Jonah's head, shading him from the sun. This eased his discomfort, and Jonah was very grateful for the plant. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry because the plant died? Yes, Jonah retorted, even angry enough to die. Then the Lord said, You feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? Let us pray. Our Father, we just thank you for this day. We thank you for this time that you've given us to come together in your presence and to open up your word. Father, I pray that you would push me out of the way. I pray that as you stand here this morning, I pray that you would speak to us in a direct way. I pray that every word that is spoken is coming directly from you. May we seek your guidance. May we seek your wisdom today as you speak to us, as you speak to our hearts. I pray that we would open our minds. I pray that we would open our hearts to what it is that you have prepared for us today, Father. We love you and we praise you and we ask for all of these things. It's in Jesus' name that I pray. Amen. You may be seated. So today, we're going to see how Jonah responded to God's movement that he just witnessed in Nineveh. The number one point that I want us to see is Jonah complained of God's mercy, and as a result, we see Jonah had a rebellious heart. That's the first thing we see in this story, is the fact that Jonah complained and became rebellious. The rebellious heart. Jonah's conversation with God here in Jonah chapter 4 was actually a prayer. It may not have sounded like a prayer, but it was actually a prayer in which Jonah was speaking directly to God. And in this prayer, Jonah was complaining. Jonah had an attitude. He was angry that God extended grace and mercy to the people of Nineveh. Now, doesn't that sound a lot like Christians this morning? Doesn't that sound a lot like us, the fact that we want to complain, that we want to get an attitude, that we want to get angry when things don't go our way? When we get mad or when we get angry with our brothers and sisters in Christ, sometimes we want to seek that anger towards them, and we don't think that they're worthy of God's grace and that they're not worthy of God's mercy. That goes completely against what God's Word tells us. God's Word is an example of grace. Everything that we see in God's Word is an example of God's grace and mercy. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, do you feel as though Jonah had the right to get angry? He had absolutely no right to get angry. He went, if Jonah would have opened his eyes, he would have realized and he would have seen that God saved him. God sent the storm to capture him, to bring him to Nineveh, and he used a fish. What does God desire to use in your life this morning to get a hold of you? Because I think this morning, I don't just think, I know this morning that God is trying to get a hold of Christians. God is trying to get a hold of many of us this morning that have been complaining, that have been angry, that have been resentful. Those are not attributes of Jesus Christ. And we have no right. We have no right to ask God why one person is more worthy than another person because God created us all in His image. God loves us all the same. So since God created us all the same and since he loves us all the same, doesn't that mean that we should love each other the same? 
I'm tired of living in a country over the course of the last six months, the last couple of years, all we've seen is hatred. All we've seen is hatred and rebellion. All because of politics. People hating each other, spitting at each other, speaking maliciously and slanderous against each other. I look at that this morning and my heart breaks for this country. My heart breaks for the Christians that actually participate in that slander and that actually participate in that maliciousness. And this morning it's time we step back and we realize that God extended grace and mercy upon us. So if he extended the grace and mercy upon us, don't you think we could extend it to our brothers and our sisters? Don't you think that we should take the opportunities to go and send missionaries to countries that aren't Christianity? You know, I've heard it said by Christians before that Muslims deserve to die. No, Christians deserve to die. Christians deserve to die. But God sent His Son, Jesus, to save us. So the first thing that you see here is Jonah complaining, Jonah rebelling, Jonah looking at God and saying, Why, God? The Ninevites, the Assyrians, they didn't deserve what you did to them. When you look at it, we didn't deserve it either. Jonah didn't deserve it either. One thing I do give Jonah credit for is Jonah was honest with God in his prayer. He truly told God what was wrong. And he opened a window where we can actually see his heart here in chapter 4. I want you to notice the following four phrases in Jonah's, I'm sorry, in Jonah's conversation with God here in chapter 4. And I want you to look every one of these phrases begins with the word I. The first thing, the first phrase I want you to see here is didn't I say. In chapter 4 verse 2, Jonah says, so he complained to the Lord about it. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? In this verse, Jonah tried to correct God. He tried to tell God, didn't I tell you so? Didn't I tell you so, God? Didn't I tell you that these people weren't worthy of your grace and your mercy? Based upon what we read in this verse, and other parts of 1, 2, and 3 of Jonah, we actually see where Jonah lectured God when the Lord initially called him to go to Nineveh. How many of us this morning are lecturing God because he wants us to reach out and he's calling us to go somewhere and we're saying no, God. We're saying no. You don't want me to go there. They're evil people. I can hear God looking right back at us and saying you're just as evil because we are just as evil as anybody else. One thing I've learned over the course of the last year in my life, and this is sad to say, and it's a bold statement, but it's true. And that's the fact that Christians are mean to each other, they're brutal. The world looks at us as his children, the world looks at us as Christians. And they see us as hypocrites. Can you imagine? Can you imagine what this country would look like? What this world would look like? What the church would look like if we weren't so hypocritical? If we actually practiced what we preached? If we actually walked the walk and not just talked the talk? If we were actually doers of the word, as it says in James. Can you imagine 
what this world would look like. We see here in verse 2 where Jonah informed of informed God of two things in that initial conversation. Number one, Nineveh deserved God's judgment. Number two, God had chosen the wrong person to go to Nineveh in choosing Jonah. Jonah wanted God to conform to his wishes. Does God conform to our wishes? Absolutely not. God does not negotiate with us. God is not going to negotiate a contract with you. When you become a child of God, you accept Christ into your life. And you say to God, okay, God, I will follow you. I surrender all. Have you surrendered all this morning? Or are you just holding some of it in your back pocket because you're afraid to surrender it all? Jonah was, a, Jonah was afraid to surrender it all. Where are you at? In your life this morning, are you saying, God, you've chosen the wrong person? If you feel God speaking to your heart, if you feel God calling you into something, you can't go back with the answer to God, you can't use me. No, don't, don't play that trick with God because that doesn't work with God. Jonah tried to run from God when God was calling him to go to Nineveh. But we all see, and we've all seen over the course of the last couple of weeks, how that worked out for Jonah. You cannot hide from God. If God desires to use you, he will make a way for that to happen. So why is it that we feel as though we can convince God that he does not know what he is doing in either his treatment of others or his calling to us? The answer to that is selfishness. I said there were four phrases that I want you to see here under this point, and they all begin with I. When you see something and it begins with I, that's selfishness. If every word out of your mouth is I did this, I did that, and you don't take the time to listen to what others are telling you, that's selfishness. In order to serve Christ, we have to get rid of that selfishness. We have to say goodbye to ourselves. Every morning, one of my first prayers is, God, I surrender all to you. I surrender my own wants, I surrender my desires, and I'm pursuing you today. Do you pray that way in your own life? Because you should be. Serving God requires sacrifice of yourself. You have to give it all to Him. You can't say, I'm going to hold on to this, but you can have this part of me. you got to turn it over all. you got to surrender all. When we are trying to ask God to conform to our wishes and our desires, we're being selfish. There's been many a times over the course of the last five months in my life where I've been selfish. And I said, God, why do you want to use me? Why do you want me to do what you're calling me to do? And there's been many a time, many a time, where it's not been my wish and my desire. But I know, even though it may not be my wish and it may not be my desire, I know that God has a plan. And I know that I have to sacrifice what I want for what He wants. Because I know when I sacrifice what I want for what He wants, He's going to be glorified. And that's what I want to happen in my life. I want God to be glorified in my life. Do you want God to be glorified in yours? We should all want God to be glorified in our lives. And when you're living for yourself, you're not living with an attitude of God being glorified in your life. Many Christians today are asking God to conform to their wishes. That's not going to work out. Many Christians today are trying to bring things into the church that aren't of God. If we expect God to conform to us, 
We're going directly against God's manual, God's word. If we're living selfishly, we're doing exactly what we see here in Jonah chapter 4 and verse 2 with rebellion. If we're living for ourselves, you're rebelling against Christ. The first phrase I want you to see is, I ran away. That's also here in verse 2. And I'll read verse 2 again. Didn't I say before I left home that you would do this, Lord? That is why I ran away to Tarshish. When God didn't listen to Jonah, Jonah decided that he was going to try to thwart God's plan by refusing to participate in what God was calling him to do by going to Nineveh. We see that here again because he ran away. Ultimately, Jonah ran from God because he did not want the Assyrians to have the opportunity to genuinely and truly repent. He didn't like the Assyrians. They were... We've read, we've read about it and we've seen it before in Nahum. It talks about just how evil the Assyrians were. But in light of being evil... God wanted them to have the opportunity to repent and seek forgiveness too. I've heard it said to me, people have come up to me before and said, God could never forgive me for what I've done in my life, for the mistakes that I've made in my life. God would never forgive me. God could never use me. That's not the God that we serve. God wants to use those mistakes to to be glorified. And God was wanting to use the mistakes of the Assyrians to be glorified. God wanted to be glorified through that situation. So we can actually see Jonah's heart here. He wanted the Assyrians dead. That's why he ran. Here in a few minutes we'll talk about the fact that Jonah was more concerned about his reputation amongst the Israelites than he was with his reputation with God. This morning, are you more consumed in your reputation with people than you are with your reputation with God? I think there's a lot of Christians today that are more concerned about their reputation with fellow brothers and sisters than they are in serving God. Is that you this morning? We can't avoid a calling of God because we don't like somebody. Because we think somebody may be evil or anger or have bitterness or have sinned and made mistakes in their life, that doesn't mean they're not worthy of the same forgiveness that God gave me and you. God has called us to go out into the hedges. God has called us to go out into the highways and the byways to proclaim the good news and to make disciples of all nations. He didn't say, you stop here or you stop there. He said, you go everywhere. Have you stopped going where God wants you to go? Because you don't like it. And you don't think you should have to do it. Well, shame on you. Shame on you for thinking that you're better than one of your brothers and sisters in Christ. Or you're better than somebody that's lost. Because we all used to be in that state. There was one day where we were dirty, rotten sinners. But when you accept Christ into your life, you become a new creation. You become a child of God through the blood of Christ. We see this in the church today. We see people running away. 
because they don't want to do what God is wanting them to do. So because they don't want to follow through with God's plan for their life, they get angry, they get bitter, and they leave. That's not God's desire for you this morning. God's desire is to empty, uh, empty you of that anger, to empty you of that bitterness, to clean you, and to take you where He wants to take you. So we have to stop running away. God's called us to reach out to all people. I talked about some churches today don't want certain types of people within their walls. Some churches today want to have a specific racial. They want to have a specific social makeup, which is completely wrong. This doesn't fulfill God's commandment. God's not concerned about our desires. God's concerned about His desires. When we or churches do this, we're ignoring our calling and we're disobeying God's commandment. We're disobeying the Great Commission when we're putting limitations on what God desires to do. Jonah was putting limitations on what God desired to use him to do. Are you putting limitations on your life this morning as to what God wants to do in your life? Today's the day that you say, God, okay, I'm tired of this. I'm going to stop putting limitations on my life, and I'm just going to step out in faith and ask you to take me forward. I can assure you, because I've seen it in my life time and time again, when you're willing to give up what you want and you're willing to accept what God wants, number one, God's going to be glorified. Number two, you're going to have a joy in your life that goes beyond understanding. Don't you want a part of that joy this morning? I know I want that joy. It's been a rough week in my life. But I've had that joy in Christ all week because I've focused on Him. Third phrase I want you to see in Jonah's prayer is, I knew... Again, that's in verse 2. I knew. Jonah was upset because he knew God was merciful. He knew God was compassionate. He knew God was slow to get angry. And he knew that God was filled with unfailing love. He knew all those things. But he chose to ignore those things to pursue what he wanted. To pursue his plan. Have you ever become angry in your spirit because God blessed someone else? Because God used someone else? Jonah was angry because God blessed the Assyrians when they repented. Jonah was angry because he didn't destroy the Assyrians. It's not God's desire to destroy anybody. When you look back to the Old Testament... You saw God destroy people, but those those people were given the opportunity to run from their sin. And they chose to make the decision not to run from their sin. You're making a choice today if you're participating in sin. God's desire is for you to confess that sin. And to genuinely repent from that sin so it can be used for your glory. Just as he did. That was God's desire for the Assyrians. For God to be glorified. He wanted the Assyrians to repent. He wanted to give them forgiveness. In fact, he sent, he he originally called Jonah to preach and wished Jonah preached. That judgment was coming. But due to the fact that God is a merciful and a compassionate God, you will see later on in this sermon, God chose not to destroy the Assyrians. 
God's desire is not to destroy anyone. God's desire is for everybody, everybody throughout this world. He, God wants them to be a child of God. He doesn't want to kill anybody. He doesn't want anybody to die and go to hell. That's not what God wants. That's a choice that he leaves for us to make. But it's up to us as Christians, it's up to us as children of God to go out and to proclaim that good news. Just as God was using Jonah to proclaim to the Assyrians. Jonah realized the greatness of God's love as we see him speak the following here in this chapter. Number one, Jonah knew that God is merciful to the guilty. Number two, Jonah knew that God is compassionate on humanity. Number three, Jonah knew that God is slow to become angry even in the face of grievous sin. God is slow to get angry. Number four, Jonah knew that God is rich in faithful love on those that are unlovely. I call that unconditional love. No matter what you do in your life, God still loves you. There is no other type of love in this land, in this world, beyond God's love. It is the only, God's love is the only type of love that is non-conditional. Number five, Jonah knew that God is willing to relent from sending judgment on those that repent. Jonah was upset because he could not change God's attitude towards sinners. Jonah hated the sinners of Nineveh. And God loved the sinners of Nineveh. That should be comforting for you and I this morning. You and I, while we may still sin, because that's our human nature, God still loves us. And the great thing about serving God and about when we do sin is no sin is worse than the other. All sin is sin in God's eyes. And God will look at that sin and he'll want to erase it. He'll want to erase it. But you have to take that choice. You have to take that choice to take that sin to God. And you have to take that choice to take that sin to those that you hurt. Jonah refused to see the Assyrians as candidates for grace, while God did consider them candidates for grace. Jonah was more concerned about his own reputation than he was God's reputation. If people repented, he knew none of his warnings would come true that he preached to the Assyrians. So as a result, he was worried about his own reputation. But he was also worried about his reputation with the Israelites because some of the most fierce enemies of the Israelites were the Assyrians. So this morning, I'm going to ask you, are you more interested in getting glory for yourself? Or are you more willing to give God the glory? Are you... Are you more interested in getting glory for yourself this morning? Or are you more interested in giving the glory to God where it's due? Jonah, at this point, was more interested in getting the glory for himself. Fourth thing, fourth phrase I want you to see can be seen in Jonah chapter 4, verse 3. And it says here in Jonah chapter 4, verse 3, Just kill me now, Lord. I'd rather be dead than alive 
if what I predicted will not happen. Take my life. Take my life. Jonah was more concerned about his reputation than God's plan. Due to the fact that Jonah had preached to the enemies of the Jews, Jonah was feeling as though he had lost credibility with the Jews. Reputation. That's reputation. The people of Israel, they did not want to share God's word with Gentile nations in Jonah's day. But they also resisted this in Paul's day. Can you put up 1 Thessalonians chapter 2? I'd like to read verses 14 through 16. And then, dear brothers and sisters, you suffered persecution from your own countrymen. In this way, you imitated the believers in God's churches in Judea, who because of their belief in Christ Jesus, suffered from their own people, the Jews. For some of the Jews killed the prophets, and some even killed the Lord Jesus. Now they have persecuted us too. They failed to please God and work against all humanity. As they try to keep us from preaching the good news of salvation to the Gentiles. By doing this, they continue to pile up their sins. But the anger of God has caught up with them at last. The people of Israel had forgotten their original purpose as a nation here. Just as Jonah had forgotten the purpose of the original nation of Israel. It was to be a blessing to the rest of the world by sharing God's word everywhere. And we can see that in Genesis chapter 22 verse 18. And through your descendants, he was speaking to Abraham here, all the nations of the earth will be blessed, all because you have obeyed me. Are you willing to be obedient to God this morning? Or are you rebelling? As Jonah was rebelling. Jonah was throwing a temper tantrum here in chapter 4. But you see, the problem with Jonah... He was serving himself. He was serving himself. While Jonah did repent, and he did submit to God while in the belly of the fish that we read about in chapter, in chapter 1, pride and prejudice had returned. And they returned and flamed. I want to point this out. Our sins, just as they did in Jonah, they will do the same thing in our lives. Our sins will do the same. They will return if we don't stay grounded in God's Word. How do you avoid living a sinful life? You get in God's Word. You speak to God on a daily basis. You have that prayer life with Him. You know, I've heard Christians say, I don't need churches, but yet God's Word calls us to have fellowship amongst believers. The whole reason for the church is to encourage each other, is to take the burdens of each other and share them with each other. The church, is a, it has a purpose, it has a mission, and it should be united. And we all should be united in one purpose, and that one purpose is to come together and build up each other so that we can go out there and proclaim the good news together. But you know, there's... The church today, instead of building up each other, is tearing down each other. And we can't go out there into the world this morning. We can't go out in the world this week wounded. We have to go out in the world addressing the issues that have happened this week. Addressing the problems that have happened this week. If you have a fault with somebody, today's the day that you need to address that fault with that person. Today's the day that you got to stop running away from that person because if you run out those doors this morning and you have a fault with that person, you're not going to be very effective for God this week because you're not being an example of God. 
in less than 40 days from when Jonah surrendered to God in the belly of the fish to the time that he preached in Nineveh. Jonah had those same issues with pride and prejudice again. You see, it came back full circle. Jonah's complaint against God's goodness revealed his misplaced, ungodly, and deep-seated values. Jonah was misguided. Jonah was rebelling. So, in order to in order to help with Jonah's rebellious heart, as we read about here in verses 4 through 9 of chapter 4, God actually used a plant. You see, Jonah had that divided heart. On one hand, he was God's spokesman for morality. But on the other hand, Jonah was full of hatred and contempt. Those two things don't exactly go hand in hand. Morals and hatred and contempt. God knew Jonah had a divided heart, so he actually used a plant here. I want you to see a few things that you actually see in this, in this chapter, chapter 4. Number one, you will see the weight. Jonah was hoping God would change his mind. You can see that in verse 5 of chapter 4. Then Jonah went out to the east side of the city and made a shelter to sin under as he wa- waited to see what would happen to the city. Jonah was hoping that God was going to destroy these people. Jonah was hoping these people were going to die. The 40 days of which Jonah had spoken between the belly of the fish and when he became prideful again had not expired. In this window of time, Jonah was waiting to see if God was going to judge them despite their repentance. The weed, number two. God used a plant to comfort the fuming prophet. He used a plant here to show Jonah that he had a divided heart. Number three, the worm. God intentionally destroyed Jonah's creature comfort. You can see that in verse seven of Jonah chapter four. But God also arranged for a worm. The next morning at dawn, the worm ate through the stem of the plant so that it withered away. Number four, you see a wind. God sent a scorching wind to disturb Jonah. Number five, you see the word. God asked Jonah a penetrating question. Do you have the right to be mad about the death of the plant? Jonah answered God's question here with a yes. Jonah did nothing to produce the plant. He did nothing to grow the plant. And Jonah did nothing to save the plant. But yet Jonah thought he had the right to be mad about the death of a plant. See, this plant was providing shade for Jonah. The plant was God's plant. It wasn't Jonah's plant. God put it there. So why did God ask Jonah if he had a right to be mad about the death of the plant? God asked Jonah this question to show Jonah how misplaced his values actually were. Jonah cared more about his personal comfort than for the people of Nineveh. Jonah cared more about the plant and the vine than for the people of Nineveh. He had a divided heart. This morning I'm going to ask you, is that you? Do you have that divided heart? Are you committed to God's plan for your life? Or are you committed to your own plan for your life? Are you committed to 
to loving your brothers and sisters in Christ? Loving the lost? Or do you look at your brothers and sisters and do you look at the lost and say they're not worthy? It's time that we as a church and it's time that we as Christians stand up and say, I love my brothers and sisters in Christ. I love the lost. And it's time we start showing God's heart within us. Don't you desire to see God's heart in the church? We see too much of the man's heart in the church. We see too much of man's plan instead of God's plan. We see too much rebellion instead of following. What is God saying to you? God desires that we love and that we have compassion for all people. Just as God has love and compassion for all people. How would you rate how you're doing that this morning in your own life? Are you loving as God would love? Or are you loving as man loves? And we all know that man doesn't do a good job in loving. I've seen the manly kind of love tear part of this church apart. And I'm tired of looking at man's love. I want to look at God, and I want God's love to be seen. I want God's love to be heard. And I want God's love to be shown. I'm not saying that. God's saying that. Are you willing to allow God to love everybody the same? Are you willing to love everybody the same this morning? Are you going to keep rebelling? Are you going to keep running? And are you going to keep doing what Jonah did? It didn't work out too good for Jonah. We all know... He spent three days inside the belly of a fish. Can you imagine how bad that stunk? And yet God put him right back where he was originally supposed to be. And he did what God desired for him to do. But that was not good enough for Jonah. Jonah, after he did what he desired, after he did what God had desired for him to do, Jonah looked at God and said, How can you grant grace and mercy? How can you grant compassion? How can you love these people? It's time we get out of the comfort zone. It's time we get out of personal comfort. And it's time we start loving like God loved. Are you all willing to go with me? Are you all willing to love like God loves? Are we going to keep Loving the way man tells us to. Are we going to keep loving the way the world tells us to? I don't know about you, but I look at the world and it sickens me. I look at all of this election junk and it absolutely sickens me. We are all children of God and regardless of whether or not you're a Democrat or a Republican or independent, we are all children of God and we're called to love each other. So it's time we start loving each other. It's time we stop going out in the streets and creating violence because we're not getting our way. It's time we stop putting our opinions on Facebook and tearing each other apart. And it's time we love like God. Point number three, and I'm almost done. I kept y'all an hour and a half last week. God's forgiveness reveals his loving heart. God's forgiveness reveals his loving heart. You can see that in verses 10 and 11. Then the Lord said, you feel sorry about the plant, though you did nothing to put it there. It came quickly and died quickly. But Nineveh has more than 120,000 people living in spiritual darkness, not to mention all the animals. Shouldn't I feel sorry 
for such a great city. Jonah had just experienced forgiveness. He had just experienced grace. And he had just experienced mercy. But yet he still believed the Assyrians did not deserve the same. We see here that God actually corrected Jonah's lack of compassion. Jonah did not have a right to get angry over the plant as the plant did not belong to him and he didn't do anything to take care of the plant. God did all the work. It's God's plant. So God corrected Jonah's lack of compassion here. But God didn't only correct Jonah's lack of compassion. Number two, God clarified his love and compassion. God clarified his love and his compassion. When you look at how the book of Jonah ended, it says, shouldn't I feel sorry for such a great city? That is God asking that question. I want you to answer that in your own mind. How do you think God should love us? Do you think God should feel sorry for us? I'm going to ask Sam to come up and lead us in a song of invitation today. As she comes up and as she leads us in a song of invitation, I want you to focus and I want you to look deep down in your heart. And I want you to answer that question. Am I running and rebelling? Or am I saying, God, come on. God, come on. I don't trust myself. I trust you. And I desire to do what it is that you desire for me to do. God desires to use each and every one of us in here this morning. You came into church this morning. You sat down in a pew. God does not want us to remain seated in these pews. God wants us to get up and go out into this world and to show the world that there is hope. To show the world that there is love. There's a love that goes beyond our understanding. Are you seeking that love in your life this morning? Are you doing what God desires for you to do in your life? God desires to use you. He doesn't desire to abandon you. He doesn't desire for you to run away. If you have ran away, God's arms are wide open this morning. And God wants you to run towards Him. God wants you to surrender it all. Are you willing to?
God, in my anxiety, you are working me through it, you are holding me through it, in my wondering, and in my questioning, you will pull me through it, oh, you will do Cause you are able, you are able, oh you are, you are able, Jesus, this is my heart cry, oh it is Jesus, cause you are I just found out some heartbreaking news, so I'm going to ask us to pray over it here in just a few minutes, but we were just notified that um, the Schubert's grandbaby, um, they just diagnosed the baby as brain dead, and uh, they've called the family in, so Gary, can you come up here and lead us in prayer? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we just lift up the Schubert family to you right now. We lift up that baby to you too, Lord. We know that that baby is going to be with you. And that baby is going to be in your arms soon. But Lord, that doesn't mean that the family isn't going to grieve and miss the baby. And Lord, we just lift them up to you. Pray, Father, that um, you would just be with them, comfort them. And let them see your hope, Lord. Somehow, Lord, through this, I pray that if there's those in the family and those working in the hospital, friends, Lord, that maybe don't know you, Lord, may you be glorified in this, as Dennis was just preaching about, Lord. May you be glorified. May you be lifted up. May those that don't know you see the hope that you have, have given them. And may they look at it and say, I want some of that. And may you use this situation, Lord, to draw people to you. Father, we thank you. I pray as we go into this week right now, Lord, that we would all remember that we don't deserve the love and the mercy and the grace that you give us, Lord, but that you give it to us anyhow because you love us. You love us all equally. May we remember that. May we share that with others. Father, we love you, and we lift this all up in Jesus' name. Amen.